Hi everyone, my name is Roman. This is Liam, we've got Kenny, and we've got Augustine. And this is the de- this is the design podcast I've just come up with, where basically we were going to investigate the the life of students, because we are all just graduating students and we've just graduated from industrial design. And basically we're at this pivotal moment in our life where we're moving on to the next step. And we think that we could have some some insights, some advice, or maybe even just talk about our experiences. And it could be helpful to someone just starting off in the in their career, or maybe even you've been in your career for a long time and you want a refreshing uh, reminder of, of where you came from and where, you know, how you've got to where you are today. So just to start, I'd like everyone to introduce themselves, starting with Liam, uh, first, the left hey. of the screen. Yeah, and basically Liam. just talk about what you're most passionate about within design and the type of position you're looking to pursue, to pursue after uni. Good question. I mean, I don't know if you should have started with me because I'm probably the one here who has uh, the least idea in terms of what I want to do. I'm not even sure if I want to industrial design. <laughs> Honestly, I still haven't decided if I want to go into UX. So, you know, I'm really like... I'm it's, sure. all, it's all design. So. It is all design, yeah, yeah. But it's... Yeah. I mean, so essentially, um, my, my name's Liam. I, I started uh, with you guys a few years ago. Um, and uh, I've been doing uh, industrial design essentially... Like I, essentially, I chose design um, so that I could eventually create my own product or company in the future. That's what I've always that that's why I started doing industrial design. Um, even if it's not in design, I want to, um, you know, I can use the design thinking skills for some business application, um, and that's that's essentially why I chose it. Um, I'm really passionate about you know that innovating designs. Like um, a good example would be like the life straw, which is a really simple mechanism. But that essentially eradicated, um, you know, a pretty a, a guinea worm, which was a really significant problem in some areas of Africa. Um, and it pretty much it was a simple industrial design textile product, which like, eradicated a disease. Um, and so it's kind of like those those uses of design that have really big impactful change that I find inspiring. Um, and that, as well as like the business side of it, is what drove me to to go into industrial design. Yeah, very cool. Kenny, do you want to go next? Sure. Uh, so my name my name is Kenny Lin. Uh, I'm from Fiji. I came for to uni to QT three years ago just to do industrial design. Uh, the decision at the at the time, I didn't think about what I want to do in uni until I, after I graduated high school. I had like a two month window, and I mean I kind of just did it on a whim. I was like, I just want to design design like anything like I could design mice or a backpack or like a, a bike or something and I was just recommended industrial design I looked it up I was like QT seems like a nice place so <laughs> that's what I came to and yeah essentially what I want to do like um like I kind of described either like design consultant um a freelancer but I also don't mind going into like a you know like a spe- like a specialized company like a tech company and designing like specific products like electronics. So yeah, my 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 direction is not quite there yet. It's just like I'm willing to do whatever at the time. At, at this time, I'm just kind of taking a short break. But yeah, that's me. Oh, cool. How about you, Augustine? Well, hey, uh, yeah, so my name is Augustine, and um, I was actually in the cohort before you guys, so I started a year earlier. The um, reason I chose industrial design is probably because uh, I did graphics in high school, and I found out I was pretty decent at it, so I was like, hey, this is cool, I want to do this, and also, I've got to mention the name, but there was somebody in school who was really good at what industrial like really good at industrial design and that inspired me like watching that person's work and what they did drawings ideas and all that yes, that inspired me to move into a course where you build things from scratch pretty much and you can like I guess depending on what it is you can create whatever you want however you want uh, and you can you can make uh, you can uh, uh, design it in your direction and you don't have to really um, I guess follow like a certain structure because you can do it your own way um in terms of the direction that i'd like to go into probably somewhere around like the biomedical side of things because um i just find it really interesting and very different to traditional uh industrial design yeah hopefully that goes well there but yeah that's that's uh, all about me yeah awesome and yeah i think i know 
who are you talking about in high school? Yeah. <laughs> Do I? <laughs> you know, you know. You go to the, you didn't go to the same high school, did you? Yeah, I did. Nah, I didn't. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. I went to the person, but yeah, Kenny yeah, probably knows. Okay. Yeah. But yeah, and, and I'm Roman. Uh, I just graduated and I just started straight out of uni into a design position. And after doing not much time in it, I realized that this wasn't for me. I realized I rushed into it, didn't take any time off, didn't wait and select a position that I was actually really interested in. And now I'm back in waiting for another job, but I'm going to wait for a position that actually really stands out to me um, for the things I'm interested in, not just jump into something with the title of industrial designer. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, recently I've actually got really interested in furniture design. And I think that might be my kind of thing, but for a long time, people always, I mean, I, I don't know if you guys have the same experience, but when you graduate, people say, what type of design are you going to do? And it's like, but design is so broad. Like, why would you want to narrow yourself down? That's the way I'm feeling. But I think, yeah, furniture design is really interesting. I think maybe I'll go into something like that. But yeah. It's quite different from, from uh, skateboards. Yeah, well, <laughs> I mean, I like to keep it broad, right? <laughs> but yeah, so overall, how did you find university prepared you to move into the industry? Just jump out, whoever wants to answer it. Uh, look, we, we should preface this by saying that um, everyone here pretty much did their degree during COVID. Yep. So both, both during COVID and QUT. Um, but we started, COVID started pretty much immediately. And also um, we were the first, like pretty much the first cohort that um, went from a four-year degree to a three-year degree. They, they restructured it and they chopped and changed it. And we were kind of like the, the lab rats. Yeah. So we definitely, um, I think that, like I did two degrees at Q2. The first one was a science degree. The second one was industrial design. And in industrial design, I learned, a lot more it was really engaging that that i think we can all say that the generally the staff of like mm, they, yeah. they know what they're talking about they're, yeah. they're they're really engaging they know how to teach and they care about what they're doing um but there's definitely a few elements that i think are quite sorely missed that we, we weren't taught we weren't taught enough mm. yeah it was I think, um, on yeah. yeah i think on that point i think industrial design but like i've i've never done any other course but it just seems to me that, you know, like in every single unit, you you like very well know your lecturer. You mm. probably talk to him like almost every class. And you also know all the tutors very well and probably like, you know, they give you all the help you need. And if you contact them, I, I feel like that's different, really different from like courses where there's like a thousand students. Yeah. Where we have like, I mean, the whole cohort was 80 people. So in that sense, yeah, it gives us a lot of support and, you know, it's also really engaging, like Liam said, mm. Mm. helps us a lot. Yeah, it's quite intimate, The mm. you know, and as it, we got further along and got more and more intimate, we started to know everyone. Well, even mm. the end, we graduate, well, we do our final class and our head lecturer gives us a notebook that has a personalized message in every notebook um, saying, like, you know, congratulations, like, you know, yeah. on the next step. I mean, I did business as well. And if they were doing that for business, there'd be like thousands of notebooks. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, that's the, when the budget. Uh, yeah. So that's when I realized that how passionate, like, for example, our head to our head lecturer was for our unit. Mm -hmm. Like, you don't really, I mean, you do see it, but like, I guess, like, when that moment passed away, he's like, oh, I got like a notebook for each one of you. Mm -hmm. And I've handwritten a note specifically directed at you just shows how much they, they how much passion they had for this yeah. course and this unit. So that really, like, it's really opened my eyes to the tutors there. Mm. I, think I was education, confused. You were confused? Yeah, I was confused. I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But To be fair, he is, he is like a gem of a, yeah. of a lecture. He's amazing, you know? Yeah, man. Yeah, I want to get Raph on the podcast. Oh, oh <laughs> that'd be something. You can ask him. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, if I do it. Yeah, he would do it, I think. Yeah. He's pretty open to these kind of things. Um, yeah. What skills do you wish you had refined throughout your university education? I think um, the one that's glaringly obvious to me, I was going to initially, to your question, say, I think they should mandate like more heavy, like, like much more heavy use of CAD. Like, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. it's just a requirement. Like, you know, when we did like team activities? Yeah. Team projects and because of just the breakdown of the project, it'd be one or two people doing heavy card yeah. and then, you know, a lot of, you know, people were doing other stuff, but it kind of meant that, you know, we weren't getting as much use of it as we should and much mm. experience. 
Yep. And that's like the bread and butter of industrial designers. So um, I think that that we probably could have got more exposure and it just should have been more mandated. And the other thing is um, they didn't teach enough research methods. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I think. Well, I suppose it depends what area you go into because research, I mean, yes, it is is a part of a lot of different parts of design, but obviously the foundation, we learned the foundation of research, which probably is more what you'd use in standard industrial design practices. But yeah. But like in the in the previous degree, so b- mm. before they changed it to our current degree, they had yeah. um different they had units specializing in design research, yeah, true. research techniques. Um, it's and the people were like talking to the, the alumni from previous years said, look, that was just the most monumental um units because it taught us like it you had to had to go out, you know, it was required that you go out into the public, you find it like, you know, they really pushed that in the last degree, mm. and in this degree, in some of the units, like we they because of COVID in some cases, they barred us from doing research, you know, pr- primary research. They we weren't allowed yeah. to do it. Um, yeah. So I think, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, Like co- COVID is like a, COVID is like a really big part of it because I remember mm-hmm. in my first year where uh, user interaction design, like ID one, mm-hmm. where my research came from Instagram polls because i mean that's the like i can't i'm international student i don't know anyone i've mm-hmm. never been out the house so like that was my research and they accepted it but um i think the quality of research like the fact that we didn't have a specific unit uh but you know every unit is still like if you have a 40 60 like 40 percent assessment one 60 percent assessment two it mm-hmm. usually would be assessment one is like all about research and then some concepting in the end so there was like the the overall structure for most of it and I was also like all the group projects you also have like a research in the beginning it's quite balanced in that way but um yeah the research methods you gotta gotta um like develop that uh, like on your own yourself yeah for sure yeah I, I was lucky because I had marketing and marketing was very this is a business degree it was very much like heavily research based in some cases so when I went to do the design part of it, I felt, you know, I already knew all these concepts, but I can see what you mean. If you, like thinking back, if I didn't do the marketing as a second degree, I feel like I would have missed out on a lot of research concepts. So. Yeah, yeah um, I mean, I'm doing, sorry. I don't know, you can go ahead, bro. Sorry, I'm sorry? Oh, no, you can go ahead, I'll talk after. Oh, no, I was just, I was going to say, um, yeah, I mean, like there's, there's research and then there is like, for our capstone, for example, I mean, that's, that kind of research is um you know in some roles i mean that's that's what you're the bare minimum what you're expected to do mm. the research will be previously but a lot of the uh, studio units is very minimal like it's it wasn't really enough you know yeah but with a good design a good design process mm. um i don't know that's that's for my opinion i just think that like cat and research and with, with the two two things that you know with, and also probably manufacturing like yeah um, yeah that, like greater greater you know like exposure to design for manufacture um yeah i think so yeah so i'm um, just building up from what liam said in terms of the research i felt that um for especially for id7 the research the well the amount required for the research section was way bigger than we uh did for any of the other units so mm-hmm. it's like i don't know whether like do a whole research report that's three thousand five thousand words and you're just like but i've never done this before like mm-hmm. guess for a roman You've, you've done plenty of research papers for your business degrees, but for someone who just does industrial design and who hasn't like written a report in like four or five years, because last time I wrote one was in school, uh, yeah. it's really like, it's really just out of the blue kind of to do that. But uh, yeah, and um, the other one would be, I'd say drawing. So in first first year, I think it's just first year, but um, they have design visual- visualizations and all those other drawing classes where they, teach you specifically to use coping markers <laughs> um i wish that they actually went into more digital art as in like because right now everyone has an ipad or like i don't know some sort of touchscreen device where they can use procreate or sketchbook i wish they like taught more of that as well because guys, that's question, guys out of everyone here do you guys does anyone use coping markers i have 500 dollars worth of it just sitting in my yeah. <laughs> I oh, recently no. got back into it. I never used to. No. I was doing digital sketching, and then just as I finished uni, I started getting into paper sketching again. And honestly, it's so much better. 
like I like now I'm used to the iPad. I feel like paper sketching just has so much more feedback. And I don't yeah, know, it's yeah, just, it's yeah. just great. It definitely feels nice. It definitely like it definitely feels yeah. nice organic, but I've, but, got, yeah. I've got this. It's like the well, you can't see it, but it's like the um, <laughs> the Kaiser Craft like rip off coping oh, markers. Oh, yeah. Is it like a coping oh. bleeding marker? No, but they're actually great. They're like they're alcohol markers, exactly like coping markers. Yeah. And you can even refill them with coping ink. Oh really? I do that though. Can yeah, you refill it? Like, can you ref you can refill the other ones, the coping ones with I guess yeah. it doesn't make sense. But... You can, you can, yeah. uh, but they're like thirteen dollars or something for yeah. Oh, they're so expensive. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nah, like, uh... one one like assignment is like fucking fifty dollars. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Augustine, yeah, Augustine is definitely right. Um, especially for like students, like uh, coming into my first year, like we, none of us knew too much about design. So we come in and then they're like to us. So the standard is that everyone uses copy markers, right? <laughs> so we, we we look at these markers, they're like 20 bucks each. I never bought them because my cousin had like leftovers that were like half dry, but I used them anyways to get through that, two, I think two units and then like use the rest a bit along the way. There's some Chinese root pops. But like essentially, um, they said that, and then later, half the half the cohort started using iPads, and the other yeah. half, like me, I just started sketching, but not using markers, just using the pen to shade. Mm. So, yeah. and then eventually also switched to digital, and mm. yeah, I I think definitely like more emphasis on. I think now they would put more emphasis on digital yeah. sketching, knowing that you know mm. most of the demographic comes with an iPad and sketches do the DDR on an iPad. I think yeah, the yeah. DDR yeah. Oh, knowing yeah. how you can do your DDR. Just for, for is the like, record, so the, the DDR, yeah. I don't I haven't heard of use it. I haven't heard the acronym use anymore. Where uh, else, but it's it's the design development record for anyone else listening. Um and that's the record of the entire design process. Yeah. So yeah for I feel my, like for yeah. DDR it's just ridiculous not doing it on an iPad. Like having like 150 pages of A3 paper. Yeah. I did that for like two and a half years and so I always look for an alternative yeah uh to do it somewhere else so I've I've had a digital you know the Wacom pads hooked up to my computer and doing it on like Photoshop or something is just not like when you need so many pages I look for alternatives I look for like clips to paint and then there's nothing quite like um procreate yeah that had like stacks of pages you can just pile into like one DDR or two DDR. Yeah. But then yeah, I think Augustine, Augustine got a got the PowerPoint technology and then you know, I talked <laughs> to someone. <laughs> I mean, so a PowerPoint, not recently, but I think it's been two, three years, they released um support on iPad where you can actually draw on it. And like oh. if you connect it to OneDrive, it's connected to your computer as well. So you can have your laptop screen, you can type anything you want there, and you can also draw on it and it automatically uploads everything yeah. to that. So like I used that for a bit because I was too lazy to go to Procreate a sketchbook and throw everything, export it out, put it on. So yes. yeah, that, that was another way you could have done it as well. So now yeah, there's I that. Remember. And then there's like concepts. And then, you know, I never wanted iPad because I didn't want the Apple ecosystem. Yeah, but I had to yeah. Submit, so good. submit to get it's the good, iPad. Uh, it's pretty, once I got <laughs> that, like, as soon as I got my iPad, which was in like, I don't know, I, like a year ago. So like, it's in like 30 year. I... I really just wish they got it earlier. Like, mm, I yeah, earlier, yeah. but it saves you so much time. It's just so much more versatile being able to like just yeah. like photo sketching and oh. yeah, I so, put it off for so long. I think I got it in like my third or fourth year, and yeah, um, yeah. Just to add on to that, I feel like for me personally, the biggest thing I wish I was forced to do more was to get better at sketching. Like my sketching is not too bad now, but it took a lot of time, like late in my degree, to get better at it because I feel like for a long time. I didn't, I wasn't forced into getting better. Like I wasn't getting marked down necessarily that much for not having the nicest looking sketches. But I think that in industrial design, it is very important to be able to communicate your ideas. And mm -hmm. I think that I wish it was more of an emphasis that like, because I, I remember early on, they were like, you don't have to be the best sketcher ever. And like, you don't, that a lot. but like realistically, it helps to be able to communicate your ideas. Like in front of, especially yeah. in front of a client, if you're, if you're drawing like stick men in front of a client, it's a bit, it's a bit, you know, downgrading of your reputation. Mm -hmm. And yeah. yeah, and I mean, and, and to add to that as well, the other thing I was thinking is uh, biggest thing I've noticed is I wish we were more integrated with engineers because industrial design is so closely integrated with engineers in most, in most fields. Like there's always communication with an engineer at least. Um, and we have such a large engineering cohort in QT. I feel like if we had like collaborative projects with engineers, 
like the results could be really amazing. That's a that's a really really good point. I never thought about that, but yeah. that's I mean because uh, you're right. When it comes to industry, like industrial designers, a lot of the time going to be dealing with engineers, and they're working in multidisciplinary teams. And we didn't really have that experience other than Impact Lab, but we have multidisciplinary design teams. Yeah. You know? But to work with engineers and having that back and forth would have been really useful. Yeah. Well, realistically, we're, we're more connected probably to engineers than to other des undesigned disciplines. Mm. Like we do obviously communicate with like graphic designers, things like that. But I would say that generally engineers, we probably communicate with them more in, in industry. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You got a good point about the like the campus that we were on. They're changing it. They're changing it. I think next year. But um, essentially, we have like design and then a whole lot of engineering. There's others. There's also a law faculty there. But there's a lot of engineers at Gardens Point UT, and there's a, a good good bunch of industrial designers as well. So it would have been. There's no reason they couldn't integrate units where you have to collaborate like that. Yeah. yeah. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. I think it'd be it. it would need to be quite selective though so for example like we had we had a couple of units where it was like design for manufacture was, i think that was id4 mm -hmm. and like some other units where yeah uh, it might force students to think about like specs and think about like all those constraints and i think in the beginning um probably just like uh to not like restrain your design mind to keep it open-ended and then afterwards, when you're when they're like more well versed in the design space, just chucking those engineers to pick their brains. Yeah, it was funny having some double degree uh, engineers in the capstone unit. Just oh, chatting yeah. to them. It was quite a couple. Yeah, yeah. no, it was a lot. Yeah, it's yeah. also so we also should mention that like when we started, it was also the first year that they offered a double degree. I think it was the first year they offered a double degree with engineering. I didn't and know Mm -hmm. um, I actually started doing that. I started with a, oh. a double degree, and then uh, I dropped the engineering. I did, I did, uh, I think six, six or seven units. Um, and then just as I dropped it, it like destroyed my course structure. Just like completely messed it up. I haven't actually graduated. I've got another year. Really? Oh. I, did, well, I did my capstone a year earlier. Yeah. Oh, okay. I didn't even know that. <laughs> yeah, I've got, I'm going to be like I the wrong guy on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, uh, okay, I can leave if you want. Yeah, mate, you're out. You're out. <laughs> you can just mute me. Um, <laughs> yeah, but uh, uh, you know, it just my next question just... doesn't line up anymore. Then we're down to three. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> next question? So my next question is: Do you find it daunting as a postgraduate student making the leap to employment? So you could maybe you know think about what you'd feel like in a year. <laughs> no, I'm looking for jobs. I'm, I'm still like I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. Still looking for, for work. Um, in the background, <laughs> just know. behaving as a postgraduate. Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. It's it's for me like a, it's a bit of a different question for me because I'm still deciding like, do I want to go industrial design or do I want to go into the path of UX? Um, and that's what's daunting for me. And in the process, in the next year, I'm, I'm part of my course is going to be a work and degree learning minor, which is yep. essentially do internships uh, in place of units. Like the one unit is one internship, so I'm going to be going to different employers and looking, doing some industrial design work, doing some UX work, um, and I guess it that that kind of question of what I'm going to do is is, is daunting, I guess. Yeah. Penny. So we are jumping to the next question, right? That is the next question. Yeah. Right? Uh, oh, go for it. So, uh daunting huh yeah i think number one is just um yeah i, I don't really like your experience actually I, I think helps me a little because um i'm not exactly sure whether i should be like because i just graduated and i don't really want to like because my time here oh well i have three years now like if i get my graduate visa a bit also don't want to waste my time so i i kind of thought in my head like i was like oh you graduated you gotta get a job straight away but then i also was like but like a break would be nice though, right? So I was like, oh, okay, maybe wait till Jan. And I was just like, okay, now what job? I look at LinkedIn and like, as soon as there's like a job saying industrial design, I'm like, yo, how about that? So, and industrial design is not exactly the the most popular, like well, mm. not popular, but like the most common, right? Like mm. if it's UX, then there's like a thousand jobs out there. You can apply it's for pretty, it's pretty good, though. <laughs> yeah industrial design is like the exact opposite it's like quite cold and i've been told by lecturers that most of those jobs aren't advertised it's like more networked yeah so i think that is that is quite daunting knowing that um 
the jobs that I want might I might not even know about. And yeah. yeah, like having to use connections and the fact that you told me that you started this job, like you told me about it, and I was like, nice for Roman, good for him. And then next week he's just like, Oh, I quit my job. I was like, Oh, okay, so that can happen, right? Like yeah. I can go into a job. And I'm never that kind of person, so I've never I've never yeah. quit a job that soon, but it just wasn't working. And I was like, the longer I stay here, the less productive I'm going to be because I'm not really doing anything near what I want to be doing. Yeah, I'm going to, yeah. we're going to ask you about that later on. This yeah, we'll podcast. talk about it. Yeah. yeah. The, the host becomes the, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, essentially, yeah, that, that, yeah, I don't want to really rush into anything and be like, but I, I also don't know whether I should have that kind of experience where I'm like, oh, uh, like mm-hmm. kind of look at what all the firms are like and be just not be afraid to just like hop out and be like yeah see i don't regret it necessarily because i think that it got it gave me a perspective on what i want to do because Mm -hmm. before i I had no idea really and i just thought you know i jump into something with the industrial design title and then go from there but now i realize that's not what i want to do i want to do something more specific and yeah i don't think it was i don't regret it ultimately but yeah Yeah, i mean it is pretty daunting because you're out of uni you don't have like a I get a set structure on what to do and things like that because graduated so uh especially if you're going for like a job that's more like a design firm or a consultancy and not like a manufacturing job it's it's very limited in Brisbane um majority of those type of jobs are always in like the bigger cities like Melbourne uh Perth to somewhere there um so whereas like the manu- uh, manufacturing jobs like I don't know designing for trucks things like that they're very, uh, those just types of jobs are very popular but I, that I found out but that's not something that I'd like to do I'd like to go straight into like the actually like the actual design firms or even like an academic role like research or something like that so I found it very um really um guess daunting doing that as well as uh making my portfolio so go, going into the process of finding my old work re-rendering everything so it fits into my website and doing all those things so I can get that website sorted out. So, yeah. Yeah. Would you guys, um, are you guys willing to travel? Like, I mean, travel substantially to, to find work? If you found a job and it's in Melbourne or it's in Sydney and it's like your first, first graduate job, but it looks amazing, would you guys be willing to travel? I travel domestically, but... Originally, after uni, I was planning to move back overseas because I used to live in London when I was um, 18. But I think that, yeah, oh, it's all good, Augustine. We'll just reset it. Um, I feel like, yeah, now I have a very complete life here and I don't think I want to be moving internationally. But yeah, definitely domestically, I think. It's the opportunity came up. What about you guys? Um, I, I'm actually not sure. I oh, sorry. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Uh... Like part of me thinks it's a like I think if I could find something like domestic uh domestic when I say domestically I mean like Brisbane. Uh I would because like I got it's just cause I have like two family here. Like my, my brother and cousin who came over and we kinda just try to stick together, but mm. like aside from that, yeah, I'll definitely try to get get a job here. But otherwise, I'm not, I'm not closed off to like even overseas because I'm international in the first place. But yeah, mm. trying to settle down here is like definitely better. How many industrial designers are there in Fiji? Zero. <laughs> <laughs> there could be one though. Uh, yeah. You can start your own firm. You got no monop- you got a massive monopoly right there. Fiji like more, co- like, I guess like in product design in a like product like industrial design in Fiji is more like carpentry or something, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's the most we'd probably do there like designing fiji water bottles or something I don't know. <laughs> um mine's very similar to kenny as well i'd rather stay in brisbane locally um because family friends everyone's here and i don't really like the idea of i guess moving to another state or another place or internationally as well um but i guess if it's the right job or if it's something that's really good or something that I really wanted, I would be uh, willing to go to like a different state, but not internationally. 
you know, I think we have a relatively small design scene in Australia compared to global, compared to America, England, Asia, places like that. But I think that it is getting bigger. And I think if we stick it out, I mean, when you look at people like Rob Geddes, uh, who, if no one does who Rob Geddes, he's a Hall of Fame DIA member now. Hall of Fame. He started off industrial design in like the 80s, I'm going to say, in Brisbane. And he basically was the first design agency in Brisbane. And since then, I mean, he basically pioneered design here. And I mean, we have a bigger design scene than probably South Australia, um, I would say. Yeah, I so. Maybe WA as well. I don't know. It's hard to know. I don't really, I don't really know that much about it. But South the, Australia, like yeah. Melbourne and stuff. Yeah, we got Melbourne. wine there. No, no. South Australia is uh, like Adelaide and a bunch yeah. of vineyards. So I hope we got some uh, of the design thing. Yeah, okay. No, I mean, I great. It's so well designed. <laughs> Honestly, it's amazing. But anyway, my point is like people like that have pioneered it and they've put on the, all that footwork to get design to where it is now. So I wouldn't, I would like to stay here and, you know, do my part for Australia and try and help out Australia get to the next level of design. Like we're, we're legit the next generation of designers. Like we're the ones who's going to take it to the next level now. So I feel like, you know, it's so oversaturated overseas, but we, we have the chance to like, you know, help it to get to the next level here. Yeah, that's what I've heard some people say where like overseas, like it's it's the peak of industrial design already, whereas <laughs> like places like Brisbane, it's like very upcoming developing places. Yeah. And it's also more chill over here, so which I like. So mm. yeah, definitely. Is, is there anything you guys like you, you wouldn't want to do as industrial designers? Like any kind of fields or uh, like, like what what would an example of that be? Uh, like you said, furniture design. I can, For me I can, personally, I would yeah. enjoy furniture design. Oh, okay. Yeah. I can go um, from like my experience in recently, and I mean, I thought that I wanted to just generally have a design job, just work in manufacturing because it's the most common thing. And now I'm realizing that I, I'm not, I'm not opposed to manufacturing, but I need a job where I actually design things, and I'm actually, you know, sitting there coming up with ideas, problem solving. Like design can be very much like industrial design can be just CAD. Like you could just be sitting there all day doing up designs that people sometimes come up with in CAD. But I want to be able to be part of the design process. I want to, you know, come up with ideas basically and, you know, fix problems. Because I think like I've been, this has been drilled into my head for so many years now. I can't just go into my career and not do that. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. But yeah. apart from that, I'm honestly easy. I would work in any field. Anything? I'd design kids' toys, whatever. But... That seems fun though. Yeah, I, kids saw, I would be keen for kids toys. What about toilets? Would you do toilets? toilets. I saw that on Indeed oh. uh, on C. Really? Yeah, I saw the uh, toilet sewer system, whatever, uh, like design oh. job. What about? I think was, what about like rat traps and like and like in you know. I mean, the, only thing I would, to do. the only thing I wouldn't design is like weapons, probably. Like, I wouldn't want to be like designing guns for the military because I think that's I kind of mess destruction. But also, though. wouldn't that be so cool? <laughs> yeah, dude, I wouldn't mind doing that. <laughs> it would be so cool, but also it'd be so, I feel really immoral about doing it. Yeah. And then, yeah, anything like particularly that goes against my moral code. But I mean, apart from that, I'm honestly easy. I think it'd be cool to be having like a diverse lifestyle where you design like a boat one day and then like a toilet the next day. It'd be great. <laughs> Yeah, but such, I mean, I feel like you'd, you'd really specialize into one thing and then, yeah. you know, it'd be quite hard to do that. But Go do down guys, the rabbit hole sometimes. Did you guys yeah, design the toilet in first year? Yeah. No, no. Oh, yeah. you Wait, did you? Yeah, yeah, we I were in the did. same year. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That was, they, that was the most fun to, I had in this week. What did they change to? The camera, I don't I think? No, 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 it's not the camera. What was that? ID1, yeah. ID1, the second project. It was a grip now. Yeah, so we so essentially when we did, it, I think I must have done. I did it with you, Kenny. I think did I? I use the center design. Um, we yeah. did, we did um grip, grip. Yeah, that's right. Grip. Handles. Yeah, that's actually like interface. So you could choose. For me, I chose to do um, I chose to do a camera, and then you get to redesign it. Um, uh, essentially, what was it? What was the exact criteria actually? A camera. Wait, when when did you do it? Did you do it um, because you were double degree. Did you do it in twenty twenty or twenty twenty one? I was doing um, it when I was doing ID four as well. Oh uh, yeah, because I think the people who did cameras were like the twenty twenty one group. I did it in twenty. No, no, you you could do whatever you wanted. Like some people, it had to be something that's like a stick. When it was my year, like 
like oh, with really? like that. The main yeah. activate something that had an interface. That's so ah, someone. Yeah, did yeah, a, yeah. That's different. Yeah, some someone did like a a console for people who have sensory issues. Um, oh. but you gotta they're really just focused on the you know anthropometrics and grip. My, mine was for someone who had it had a criteria to it, and I was like, oh, they've had they have one hand. Um, and so that was mine. It was like an action camera for, they had it for a person with one hand. Mm. Um, that's interesting. Yeah, it was. Hey yeah. Siri. Huh? Hey Siri. Siri. <laughs> just, oh, yeah, like, Siri. just like, just yeah, like, yeah, yeah, into it. Like snowboarding and like you know. Ours um, was a toilet that that had to be able to be sat on because it was a cardboard toilet and without it collapsing. Yeah, so, and without collapse. Yeah, it had to be strong enough for people to sit on it, and it didn't collapse. So, so what's the so what's the diff? Is, is that a design thing or like well, a prototyping? Like, thing? That was one component of it, but there was like obviously it had to be ergonomic, and you had to like talk about what oh, yeah, okay. it fitted. But and like, also the way it was yeah. built as well, so you can't use adhesives, and they gave yeah. you this massive sheet of cardboard. It's corrugated cardboard, so it's about yeah. like ten centimeters thick, I think. And you had to carry that from uni yeah. back to your home. So I had to like carry that on the train. You went ten centimeters. Like, huge. It was like three meters wide yeah. and like two yeah. meters tall or something like that. You can't use uh, adhesives. Has to hold up to hundred kilograms. And uh, has to look aesthetically pleasing as well, but it was really fun to do though. Yeah, it was cool. I see. They they must have cut down the prototyping because um when I did it, it was like the start of COVID, so I just had like oh. foam blocks at home using a Stanley knife. I chopped it out, and right, we had sandpaper right. yeah. that we brought in from like week one. Yeah, we were lucky because yeah. like Augustine and myself were both in the like I think we you had one year right before it went yeah. to COVID. Yeah, two thousand nineteen was it? yeah yeah, yeah same. So yeah. Um, going on from that, uh, do you see design education changing significantly in the coming years? Uh, yes. Especially with all these new technologies coming out. Like right now, AI is the biggest thing that's, no. I guess, the biggest tech <laughs> development thing right there. And, um, <laughs> I guess, uh, AI was in my question, so don't look too was it? Was it? <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah, I'd say that. And apart from that. Probably the way they teach, because um, I know for industrial design, after every unit, they take feedback and they try and change it so it's more optimized for the next uh, cohort. So when when I started, when me and you started, we were the first uh, the first co uh, cohort to go in the new um, redesigned industrial design course, apart from the one that they had before. Um, so in that, pretty much all the new units that we had, for example, I think it was advanced CAD or advanced manufacturing. Where they had to like where we had to make the thermometer thing but um that was a brand new unit and there's literally no prior information or anyone else who did the same unit as us because it was the first time that unit ran um and we were essentially the guinea pigs like liam said and uh, because of that they take all that feedback and they change it for the next year because when i asked somebody uh who was in the year after me um i asked them oh how did this go and they're like oh we did this we did that we had better lectures um we had a, a different project or something like that. And it was just much easier for them because they also had the previous years, um, I guess, uh, work and wh where they can base theirs off. So I'm yeah. pretty sure they'll, they'll change it every year. So it's much easier and much, I guess, informational for the people who are actually going to study it. I think that it's, um, that it was probably a mistake to go from a four to three degree. Mm. I found out, um, resource that the reason they did that is because it's a trend within universities to go from an honors degree to a non-honors degree within three years so that people can finish the degree faster and that's why they did it so that they thought it'd be more popular so they made it a three-year degree um right. yeah uh, so i think that was kind of a mistake and i think that um uh i don't know i mean i, I think it's like our education had to change um, but I can't, I, I don't know where it's going to go. I, I think that a way to improve it would be to have more, um, like real world experience. Like I, if, if I, if my degrees were modeled kind of like the engineering degrees and that they have, uh, a semester, like they have a, a year where they do the honors and they have a mandated required experience. Like you need to go find an internship or work somewhere for X amount of hours. I think that that would be really useful. Hmm. Um, would you would you say that at least honors degree would be better than the bachelor's degree that they have right now? Look, I, I, I did I didn't do that. I, like I just I've got a, a, quite a few friends who did the the four year degree, um, yeah. and just based on 
look it up. I've got many, many hours of discussions with them. Um, the our degree is like quite, quite different from theirs. Mm, um, yeah, but they didn't. They didn't have that. They didn't have to do an internship. Um, you know, but I think it'd be useful. A, a lot of people don't know what they want to do. They don't know like they're studying industrial design, but and they have this idea of what's going to be like when they finish, but they actually have they have no idea what it's like to work in industrial design. Um, you know, I think it'd be useful if they they required that. You know, at least at some kind of mandated internship where you can at least see what it's like and see what if it's if it's um you know something you'd like to do or something you enjoy or if you want to pivot into another industry or I mean, they kind of do it with Impact Lab Four, I think, where they you get to choose yeah. to do a internship, but it's it's not really yes immersive. I'd say because when I did it, I didn't really like it because the um uh, you don't you don't get much of a choice. It's like a handful of options and. Some of them are just like purely research research based. Um, I don't remember the other ones, but like the one that I did, it was just research, and it didn't even like like the way that they did it. It was not explained well. It, we didn't even do it properly, and in the end, like our products or like our end solutions were just completely random. Hmm. Yeah, you you could have done for, instead of Impact Lab before. Yeah, there was an option to do yeah. uh, work integrated learning to an yeah, I did that. Yeah. Yeah, I did it. And I mean, I found my own internship and did it, but I think there isn't really any many options to students if they don't want to go out there and find their own internship through Will. And I think like, you, I mean, there's not really many options for uni. They don't pop up that often on like work on, um, what's it called, in place. Yeah. So like, if you don't have the motivation to go and find your own thing, it you know, you kind of don't have that option. So I think it should be something set in place by uni. Yeah. Well, yeah, I know, but also if you don't have the, if you don't have the, motivation to go find an internship it's gonna be hard to find a job yeah that's true yeah <laughs> yeah like yeah like hey like can i can i work for you for free like I, i'm i'm a student i can work for free i've got some good design skills and you know i'll be a free asset for you yeah or hey uh, i don't have any experience can you pay me and i'll work for you yeah you know like, like <laughs> i think it should be at least like mandated like you need to find your own internship mm. Because it's yeah. it requires you to do some networking, and yeah. it re requires you to get some experience and figure out: Do you like manufacturing? Do you like consulting work? Mm. I did like, two internships, and the second one was uh, I like a manufacturer doing injection molding, and I also do consultancy. Um, and the consultancy stuff really, uh, really made me depressed as when I finished because some of the stuff that people come to design is just the most moronic stuff. Like you, you're like, why do you want to spend a hundred thousand dollars in tooling to make that? Like you are going to waste your life savings and you're making the stupidest product that's ever existed. And it's going to go to landfill. Um, mm. So that was my experience. And that's kind of pushed me away from that. But you know, I know it's not always like that. Who did you do consulting with? Sorry. Who oh, I did. So I was only there for a short period, but it's um, at Dynamics. Okay. Oh, nice. Yeah. And, and they, um, yeah, no, they're, they're great over there. They're like a really like, yeah, a great, they're awesome team of people. But, um, just they had just had clients come in who just, you know, like they just have really dumb ideas, you know. Um, and it's they kind of have to take the work, but I don't, I don't know, I don't talk too much about it, but I don't yeah, know. I, the kind of experience is useful because it's see, you can see what is actually what it's really like, and not just what it looks like online or what you think it's like in your head. Mm. Um, yeah. But yeah, just um going on from that, I wanted to go a little bit more subjectively you know take it to an interesting place would you see the current trends of technology becoming more integral into design and into design education in the coming years so for for instance ai um and then another thing as well is vr like vr has already become in in my years at qt it's already become a massive part well not a massive part but a part of of, of you know uni life like gravity various, sketch yeah gravity, gravity sketch, sketch um <laughs> even even like XR has become like what through AR or not? Is it is it XR? What is it called? Like the Apple XR thing, but it's but it's know. AR. Anyway. That's technology. But yeah, it's already become a part of our degree, and I think in the future maybe it could become more. But yeah, what are your guys' thoughts on that? Do you think we're going to be going into the metaverse in a couple of years, <laughs> or do you think that's unrealistic and I, you stay pretty much the same? You could uh you could say like in terms of the metaverse, um, the only way I see the metaverse being utilized in industrial design would be for client meetings, something like that, where everyone pops on their VR goggles, VR headset, and they can visualize the product, say it's a car or it's a spaceship or whatever. It's a much easier way to visualize and show your clients or show people, this is what we made. What do you think of something like that? But um, I guess even in the work field, maybe, because the idea of metaverse being you can be anywhere in the world, 
and you can go work in the same place uh, digitally. It's something that would probably take a few more years to actually pick up because I know Facebook is, well, Meta is pushing it a lot right now, but there's barely anyone who's actually using it for work purposes. Hmm. So um, in terms of that side, it'll probably take a while. And in like, in terms of AR, when I did, when I was in uni last year, I think it's last year or the year before, um, AR was a, a bit popular. So especially in the things that I did, I pushed AR a lot. So I had incorporated AR features into my products. And because of that, I was able to land an internship somewhere where I was focusing on the AR side of things, uh, which is outside of my course, but it, it was really, it was a really different experience to try and um, try something that's different from industrial design while still being in industrial design. So yeah, that's what I think about that. Mm. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have like a lot of experience with VR, uh, VR, AR. Um, I think that, like, as the fidelity gets better and, you know, the response time becomes better, that there's definitely, like, a use case for it. It'd be amazing to have, like, you know, like a, you know, something that's modeled in, in uh, VR or AR that can function, you know, mm -hmm. like, it, it has, you can see some of the functions that, like, it'll, it'll there's mechanics to it and stuff. Um, and it's not just like a static model. Yeah. Um, I don't see why that couldn't happen. Um, and that would be really interesting to see. Um, but yeah, I don't have a lot of experience to, to go off. We have, they did do it a bit in, in uni. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what units did it, but, um, you know, you definitely saw it being used in, in some, some units. Do you guys remember any, any units that they used? Yeah, it, it was, I don't remember actually. <laughs> Andrew uh, Peterson, he specifically yeah, yeah. was pretty yeah. in love with it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I think the only one that we had experience with was uh I don't think you guys did it. It was um what was it called mass transportation, mm. oh. where we had to and in that one it was like specifically useful because um like mass transportation you're supposed to design like a large via like transportation via, do you call it a vehicle? <laughs> <laughs> like buses and stuff like yeah like we did a cable car but we didn't use vr because none of us was like really um like in touch with it none of us had a vr headset or anything mm. so and like in that sense like it's really good for context and um like one-to-one -one modeling where mm. you know of course you can see what's going on you can like have a feel at one-to-one -one scale as well without needing the physical real estate which is like the number one advantage of vr yeah. And like compared to like in industrial design, I think it definitely like next five years like mm. will become pretty mainstream. But of course, every new technology, like when you say meta, right? It, like in that sense, in like a in like a remote working kind of sense, I think meta has like a really long reaching goal. Like mm. um, like maybe in next ten years, because like these kind of technologies, like how many percent of the people even have a VR headset or even mm. thought about one, right? Compared to like when, you know, the first iPhone came out versus now when everyone's using cell phones, right? Yeah. So I think uh, it's definitely gonna, like it's still, like it's going for a similar goal as like what a smartphone did, but it's a much, um, a much more niche scenario where if you're gonna try to get all the workplaces to use metaverse, then you know, like you need to think about what a VR headset means to like everyone. Yeah, but it also like I mean, like we were talking before about um, you know, working domestically and like the amount of jobs in industrial design and some limitations there. But I mean, there's a real possibility that that it'll open up remote working for industrial designers that we haven't had before. You know, mm. like for UX designers, you can you can there's a lot more jobs because yeah. part of the reason is you can work internationally, you can work across the country, you know. Um, and you can work remotely very easily, but you know there's a possibility that with you know some some uh, developments with VR that industrial design can come a bit more like that. You know, you can, yeah. you can work more remotely and have a lot more job opportunities. Yeah, that's kind of where I was feeling. With like, um, my long term goal for design is to get to the point where I can work remote, um, in one way or another. Oh. Well, like long term, long term. Um, and I think for VR, yeah, as you're saying, it's very much like the, I can I can really imagine. I mean, I've used Gravity Sketch. I did my final assignment in Gravity Sketch, and I can really imagine there's just a group of people from all different countries around the world, all like talking, working on the same product, just in a massive space. And 
I mean, for that kind of thing, it, it really works. And like, yeah, what you're saying, like traditionally industrial design wasn't something you could do remotely because you need to do the prototyping, you need to do the collaboration. But maybe with VR, it's possible. And like, and like, even even with COVID, like we missed out on so much, you know, collaboration. And like, I mean, I don't think it affected myself too much, but I think maybe I would have got more out of uni if I had had um, in contact the whole time. But imagine if VR was implemented then, like we could have just worked collaboratively from home. Yeah, no, it definitely, no, you mentioned that, it, it affected me, like 100% mm. the collaboration um, is something that we, I think that at least I did, and I know I'm not a lot of our peers at uni agree with me because I've talked to them about it, but I think it's something we, we missed because there was a period of time where we, we didn't meet each other, you know, and then even when we met each other, like, you know, there'd be another wave of COVID and we'd have to lock down for however period of time. Um, and only recently have we, like, started to, really get to know each other and yeah. I, I got a lot from that you know meeting you guys getting mm. your thoughts and opinions and like collaborating with that I, I learned that's when i learned the most out of uni yeah yeah i agree with that yeah also productivity is just like being with people is like a hundred percent different than being at home like honestly i played like games most of the time until like deadlines came and you know you want to <laughs> sleep and it's like you know, think about cooking because food's expensive uh anyways um <laughs> on the on the subject of like covid uh i think i just read articles where like a lot of companies like after covid had the employees work from home and they realized like sometimes like a lot of times they were more productive and they had to spend less resources and they actually saved money and the productivity was the same. So they actually, after COVID, after like restrictions were lifted, they, they kept remote working. Mm -hmm. So I think in that sense, like um, we're going into VR would be like very beneficial like, in the long term, where, mm -hmm. you know, you're facing real estate, you're saving a lot of resources and uh, may maybe, maybe that means that like, people can get paid more or you make more profits like it, it can mean a lot of things mm. when real estate is like useless yeah i mean have you heard of the um collaborative work environment in metaverse where you can basically just go into a public metaverse space with random people and just do your work on your laptop and like just talk to people while you're doing it and it's just so weird like you don't even know these people it's like yeah. a it's basically like a coffee shop kind of scenario but through the library metaverse. yeah library and like what do they call that there's, there's, a, there's a what, what do you there's like um a lot of people work better with people around them or with like one partner around them mm. um, just so they feel like they're accountable yeah so i can see how that would be useful but also whack yeah weird <laughs> also, virtual coffee shop pretty pretty whack but yeah, i don't know how i think about that but <laughs> um so, have you guys tried Chat GPT? No. Uh, what's that? Do you know what Chat GPT? Do you know what it is? You don't know what Chat is GPT that the, is. Yeah. Is that the AI? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, script ah. Yeah. I I've been watching some videos of like um uh, like people trying to build a computer off like the AI prompts. Build a computer, really? Yeah. Build computers or that? Wait, I wait, I I do I chat chat what chat GPT. GPT. Oh, no. GPT. You never heard about this, about... Liam? Oh no, I know, I know about it. Yeah, I, yeah, I, got, yeah. I got, I got some mates who um, I've been using it to, to do a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, yeah. um, a mate uh, of mine, uh, pretty much wrote a report. Like he's a yeah, really good designer, but he's not the best with writing. And he oh, used yeah. it to like help him write a report, and he said it was amazing. Like it saved him hours and hours and hours. Yeah, yeah, so like the fundamental criteria to it, and then yeah, I think it was just a GPT. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. yeah, they also they also found um well there was this university student who developed a, a program to find out if reports are written by Chat GPT so then they get flagged. Yeah, but now there's also another thing that basically hides like markers that make it from AI and turns it back into something that looks like it's written by a human. It's crazy. Yeah. But Use yeah, the AI to hide AI, bro. Like, <laughs> big brain. Yeah, exactly, it's crazy. But basically, my question around this is. Do you see AI becoming part of industrial design? And in if so, what to what capacity? Yeah, I think so. I think uh, in probably a lot of design, um, in like the generative, you know, generating uh, design ideas or exploring things, I think that it's it's going to become another tool. Um, 
I'd be surprised that it doesn't. Like, it'd be mm. pretty shocking that it doesn't. People want to use it for that. It's getting better. And, you know, I mean, it's, I really would be surprised if ever or even in the, even anytime soon that you'd be able to do an industrial design product, which, you know, is actually designed for manufacture. I, I would be surprised by that. But for the term, in terms of like creating concepts and generating mm. ideas and stuff and forms and shape, I mean, I, I think so. I don't see why it wouldn't wouldn't be it would be a problem. Yeah. Yeah. So like, oh, you can go ahead, man. Go, 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 go. No, 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 no. You go, you go. All right. Yeah. So I'd say for ChatGPT, probably initial concepts would be the um the way that ChatGPT would be used. So if you're designing, say, like a chair or something, you start off with initial concepts, just pop that into ChatGPT, so you can get like a variety of ideas and just like I don't know, add random words or things that um that you found out through your research that you can get so you can get like a multitude of uh, different varying ideas and concepts you can add into it um and also uh in terms of like ai i'm pretty sure by 10 years time it will be utilized for a majority of things in terms mm -hmm. of design and not just drawings but like also how i guess uh the design process works um there was a saying that i read before it was uh, no, what was it? AI design is not going to take your job over, but the person who uses, uh, well, the designer who uses AI will take your job. Yeah. So, um, it's best to actually, I guess, go on to trends, especially industrial design. It's always important to go on to, uh, to go and follow trends that are just popped up because that way you can like, I guess, generate better ideas, um, have a better shot at different jobs because you always want to be different from every other industrial designer that's there. Mm. I think that's great advice. Like, like I adopted Gravity Sketch because basically it was new technology and I thought it would be interesting to learn. I mean, then there's also 3D printing. Now there's AI. Like, I, I think if you're a student throughout your degree, if you ever see new technology that pops up, just jump on it, you know, learn it. I mean, it's not going to hurt to learn it. You're just going to know that new technology. But if you stick to only the fundamentals, I feel like, unfortunately, you're going to get left behind, like, as the, as the industry changes. But yeah. Oh, it's interesting. Yeah. Have uh, you heard about um, the NVIDIA point cloud? No. It's basically um, like very rudimentary modeling, like CAD modeling with AI. So it uses like uh, dots to basically make up a shape. And they can already like you can be like, I want a green chair. And it will make you like a point cloud for a green chair. And you can put it into um Blender and turn it into, you know, polygons and render it. Pretty crazy. I think um like of course, like like they said, uh, like uh, AI, like AI is gonna be a tool for designers instead of like the designer. But uh, uh, like all everything that I I'm not really sure about ChatGPT, but like things like um, like Dali, Dali, Dali or like Midjourney, yeah. like they all use existing resources. So if you want anything, like I said, in a style, like the it uses what's existing there to like create the solution. So I think like for iterations, yeah, like um of things that are like it's not gonna have groundbreaking. Wait, is he? Mm -hmm. He's back. Oh, he's back. Sorry oh. about that. I just had people hammering outside. <laughs> ah, no, that's all good. No, I'm just saying like I don't think AI can come up with like groundbreaking ideas. Uh, as opposed to like iterations of how things may work because you know the data was never registered in the first place that the ai can like reference from but yeah. uh yeah and also i think ai would be pretty useful to for like for like optimizing stuff right hmm. so like we've talked about like generative design there's things that computers just you know like calculate a thousand times faster than our brain can where you're like okay i got this much material in this much space my design looks like it works like this what's the best way to make this like the lightest way possible then you know ai is probably better than you are doing that yeah yeah i mean yeah, we could, I, uh, I just sorry go on. yeah you go for it you go for it sorry. no no i was just saying um i just i just used uh, uh just the chat gpt uh and i said create a podcast script for industrial design <laughs> your whole script there you uh, go. Wait, maybe maybe I should stop. I stop writing them and just use that. Yeah. No, <laughs> or, I, or did I already do that? Come with the name. Design podcast names. It came up with design matters, design life, uh, design thinking podcast, design for. Oh, is it all right? 
Another one is uh, designing a feature. Yeah, they're okay. Yeah. I guess it depends how, how well you like put the seed information in, but. Um, yeah. Oh, it's definitely crazy. Like, I, I honestly didn't think even one, two years ago that we'd be at this point with AI already. Yeah. I, I didn't think, I mean, it. I think crazy. if you look at ChatGPT straight off, you don't think it's that crazy. But if you actually think about it and look into the potential, I think it it's crazy to think like what it could be like in even one year. Yeah. AI used to be just Google Assistant Siri. Yeah. And Siri still can't get it right. So, hey. <laughs> Yeah, even Google, like Google's going to be basically replaced by AI pretty soon. That's right. technically it. Oh, yeah, you mean like Google search engine? Yeah, Google search engine. I mean, yeah. Oh, I guess eventually. But right now, Google is much more advanced in terms of yeah, being uh, usable. Mm, to yeah, <laughs> 100%. Uh, do you see that... <laughs> I don't know what to take from this now because I feel like you guys Sorry. have already answered some of these questions. But like... Do you see, like what do you see as the as the most prominent technology going into the future for design? When does printing? Yeah. 3D printing? 3D <laughs> printing? Yeah. Like that's me for like the next 10 years, I feel like. <laughs> like I mean, I really... oh, bro. If you could yeah. go for it. You reckon you reckon that's 3D printing, that's gonna be the staple? Like I um well, I remember from first time I, like I knew about 3D printing to like buy my own 3D printer, which was like pretty crazy. Yeah. And yeah. like the things like never have had I thought that I could literally manufacture something on my desktop. Yeah. And that was like within years it was built. Like it went from a 3D printer being unaffordable to me paying 400 bucks and having this printer carry my like uni degree basically I was like, one, I wish yeah I wish printing one, heaps of models <laughs> oh, the, yeah the satisfaction from like when you design like you model something on your computer and printing it out it's just like it's pretty crazy modeling yeah. are you saying for like, like the detail design? sorry let me cut you off. yeah yeah go for it go for it That's i just mean like are you saying for industrial design like the designing process or are you saying for like manufacturing like oh i think even manufacturing actually like um the amount of like products uh, up until now for like a hundred i don't know if it's a hundred years to be honest I don't know. but like everything was designed according to manufacture according to how they can be injection molded and the mm. constraints all come from that and there's a lot of products where they're like why is it designed like that oh yeah well it had to it had to come out of the injection mode so it had mm. to be this angle and it had mm. to be so uh, like 3D printing essentially changes all of that. And when you have an idea that you want to realize, like normally it had to be, this has to work for everyone, it has to be universal because we're going to make like 200,000 of these. And if they don't sell, we're fucked. So yeah, but, uh, before but, uh, investing in anything. But will it ever, like will will 3D printing ever get to the point where it can, it can produce fast enough that... Yes. Yep. It's, it's, already, it's already there. Have you heard of a, um, Adidas's 3D AI. printed souls? <laughs> no. Nah. What so is, basically, they've made, they've made resin soles that basically use lattice work, and the yeah. lattice is designed to compress forward. So when you step, it pushes you forward automatically. Like you know how usually they're like that, like added as um, like whatever they used to call it. Like there was like a bubble. I've actually seen those. Yeah, but the, this is like souls? actually it pushes you forward now. But how long does it take to do? It doesn't even take that long. They they're able to produce it at a commercial scale now. Yeah, like they're, like they're producing like you can readily avail they're readily available issues but that's that's something that's compressible it's not like it's not very dense um you know like what about no yeah most other products like i, I, I mean it, i feel like it will get better much. like it really has got so much better in the last couple of years i'm trying to think something around me like what what is something that's like really different is that like <laughs> yeah, this is this is it's not even that big you know this is just um some scissors and this has been injection molded at the top yeah um, I mean, it's quite dense. It'll take a while at the moment, like to do something like an injection molding facility. They can just, you know, they could pump this out. I don't know how long it would take to do the cycle, but you know, it, they could just they just pump them out, you know, at, yeah. at incredible rates. Um, I don't know if that's gonna it'll ever be that fast. I but mean, it might not necessarily need to be that fast because when you think like there's advantages, like even if it's not as fast, there's advantages. Like imagine if you could run a whole factory in the size of like a house opposed to like a hundred meter squared factory. Mm. 
you know, the machinery required for injection mode. Like of of course, once you have the machinery, like per 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 machine, injection mode is just crazy. You're never yeah. gonna match that. Mm. It's just like two seconds in a parts out, right? Mm. Like no matter how like resin is pretty fast, but it it doesn't match that. But once you think about like the the implications when three D printing becomes like mainstream. 3D printers can exist anywhere, right? As opposed to, oh, this factory is in China. Like the factory that produces like this, this whatever, this, this bottle is in China. And everyone goes to that supplier, gets it, and then distributes it everywhere. And, you know, all the resources used within this process compared to if it was just like a 3D file being being shared mm. and you know like 3d printing factories can be located domestically like distributed throughout and they can produce like any product yeah like, uh, of course not any product but we'll see where that takes us but, yeah yeah i think you're yeah. on the on the money with that one i think that the future could be like you just own a 3d printer and i mean when when we get to the level where like aluminium 3d printing is commercial i mean you can have it as like a consumer or not commercial consumer grade uh, you just have a 3D printer in your home and then you you buy it on the website, get the, basically the CAD file for it or the STL, and then they send that to you and then you print it out and you get it like, you like it, it takes as long as you can print it. It doesn't matter how long it takes them to make because you can print it as slow as you want, right? I don't think that's very, I think from the perspective of like a uh, a company, a manufacturer, that's not very enticing. No. no but not. I don't think, why, why not? <laughs> because... Well, here you go. You can pirate the file. Or you can someone yeah. replicate the file. Then their product is useless. You know, someone's just copied the file or, you know, done something very similar to it, done a scan of the final thing, you know. Then all their work, all their research, and go down the toilet. They don't have any control over the actual process. Um, there's not like, you know, I mean, I, I think that's amazing too. I think mm. that's, that's a great way the, the world should go. But if, if, you know, like, how can you turn a profit doing that? You know? Unfo- yeah, but unfortunately, like, if you... Th- thought back in the day like i'm sure if you spoke to the blockbuster owners they were probably like oh no this digital movies we don't want this no one wants that <laughs> but yeah, there is. i mean it's i think it's a different thing though because yeah. um because uh like i think people would be happy to if, if their filament was cheap or the resin was cheap happy to have their own thing i you know as, as designers we all know that like we would love to be able to print our, our stuff you do um we all do. i'm saying like like we're industrial designers for the most part, make consumer products on a mass scale. Um, and I think that a company like Sony or someone, you know, obviously it's, it's, you know, there's a whole bunch of internal components in this, but I mean, the fact that they, they do the design and then they are able to do the manufacturing and then they're able to send it off and have control over the whole process um, allows them to turn a profit for their business. Um, if you have heard it, it's a design file and they send it to us and it can be pirated, you can you can purchase it. Purchase it and then I don't know, maybe there's some controls, some like controls so that it's harder to pirate or harder to copy. But I, I think that I think that most companies, you know, dealing with physical good, goods have no interest in doing that. Yeah. Massive. That makes yeah, it makes yeah. a lot of sense, but I'd say for a company that does low-level manufacturing or like manufacturing for custom orders, 3D printing would be the way to go. Because that way they don't have to spend okay. extra money on um, different tooling or anything like that. They could just print whatever they need, whatever for the client really quickly, or depending on what it is really uh, quickly, as well as to the specs, um, but not for high-level manufacturing, like manufacturing, I don't know, thousands of speakers or something like that. That wouldn't be very um i guess efficient or um mm. uh good for them because there's also a lot of limitations when it comes to 3d printing you gotta uh you gotta like um balance the bed do all of that and every time you print you have to do that but i guess it depends on the printer as well yeah. um yeah it's it really for low level manufacturing i think it could work but not for definitely not for high level and also the yes. customer, like i think um you know like the the minis like the the, the cars like this yeah yeah they're, they're I think you know. I, I don't know if you've seen the the a lot of a lot of them driving around now with um like the rear tail lights. Oh, they're yeah. customizable, and I think they're three different those. Oh really? Oh, nice. yeah. Like the you know how they have like um the Union Jack, but like part of it is it is it like that part? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like yeah. With, yeah. So um, 
uh, you know, I'm not saying I'm not saying I definitely think there's like a use for it for sure. Like, and like yeah. this, like like mass customization and stuff. Um, one hundred percent. I just I just meant like your specific analogy to having digital files. Like, I think that's also really interesting. Um, but like, say say you go and like buy uh, I don't know some I don't think of a product. Let's just like this is not a good example because you know it's all sort of you know using a blade and everything. But it's just let's just say some plastic product that or resin product that can be 3D printed. And this company gives you like a design file. You purchase it, $30, whatever, and they send you the design file. Um, is that to print it once or is it printed multiple times? Like if you print it once and then it the, the printing fucks up, does that mean that you, you only get one chance to do it and you don't get you you get to buy another one or yeah I mean these That's... are all questions we have here. <laughs> Like none of this is like really not none of this is even like systemized. Is that even a word? Like it's it's a very broad concept. Like mm. it's not even close to being realized. But just because you know, of course, right now we have a we have a very profitable structure set up by all the companies that works makes turns massive profits for them. But and like as, as as the moment there isn't even i don't even think there's a concept or like a system that exists that can even like cuz um the the our like the system right now all the profitable companies manufacturers they turn a massive profit and it works and of course there would be no reason to go away from that like mm. mass manufacturing is still the way and i don't necessarily think um like everybody having a print at home is going to be the solution but when i said like uh, the stress being more distributed would be like instead of having like a one massive factory in China that just pumps these out. Uh, like it, still, if you need a large scale, that would still be the go. But if you spread out like three D printing factories, like multiple in each country, that distributes like they can build it in their country, mm. and they they can essentially just um dis have like a much shorter distribution. As well as a lot more like access, like more accessibility, and you can also produce accordingly to like the, the small, the amount, small, small yeah. Like, yeah, small scale manufacturer. Because I mean, I, I guess, like the same thing you're saying is like you can, if you're like say you're you're a, I don't know you're, you're not entrepreneurial and you, you you design a product and then you create the tooling for it and it's say it's made in China. A lot of the a lot of the the dyes are made in China, right? But you can, as long as you have like the rights to that die, you can bring it back to Australia and just go to any mm. one of the many facilities in Brisbane and bring your die over and say, "I want to do, man I want you to manufacture it." Um, I don't. I think it's going to be interesting how it plays out, hey, because it's definitely, it's definitely has it like. I think a place for it. I think the which was one which was my next question. I think the big thing that's going to push companies towards three D printing in in the country is probably sustainability. Because right now everything's coming from China. It's all being transported overseas in like shipping containers in various ways, in these massive like diesel shipping in, shipping container boats. And I mean, I, I definitely think like the when governments start pushing towards more towards sustainability, it's going to be so much more sustainable having like three D printing farms just outside yeah. a city printing products for that city, than mm -hmm. having like massive warehouses and manufacturing facilities in China shipping all over the world. Um. I mean, it maybe not. I don't know. It, it, the thing is, you you've got to look. It's sustainability is hard because, like, from one end, it is more sustainable manufacturing um on the spot because you're going to have way better efficiency, mm. opposed to like all these little inefficient facilities. But I mean, then you don't have the transport. It's it's always hard with sustainability. But yeah, I think I think the thing with sustainability is that like say say something like it's injection molded, like say whatever whatever it is. Um, you you get a product and then say a really considerate company they might say look here are the they might say here is some files to, to to you get your product maybe it comes with a qr code um and you can scan for individual files which might be at risk of um, individual files which might be at risk of breaking and, and then instead of like throwing out your whole product you have one small component um that can be printed and said you know it could save you from you know having to buy it again or throw it out you know to put it in landfill mm. um, but also, it's probably in the interest of a lot of companies just to have you buy another one of their products. Yeah, the the money side of it is just like it controls everything pretty much. Never, right? Yeah, it never goes away. I think the only thing would be like um 
wait, what what do you call it when like government has control like government forces subsidy? you to like regulations? Uh, yeah. There's regulations. okay, one one regulation and two subsidy, oh. like three yeah. printing technology, like probably would be subsidized if mm. it ever had to become mainstream. Just because, you know, like yeah, there, there's a lot of things going on where, you know, like the what the sustainable goals like we have we're, we're supposed to achieve like five times already but keep pushing back so <laughs> well yeah that's my next question yeah. which i think links to this well um just quickly don't st- put too much time on this but just you know just to get into it do you think sustainability is a key concern and are you gonna you know follow it and implement it into your career for sure so for me it's like one of the reasons i'm considering not doing industrial design um and it's I, I know a few others who have gone from industrial design to other careers or into ux or some other field design just because they were just so sick of making just so much shit this goes mm. to landfill you know like another another water bottle or another this or another that and you know it definitely is a massive consideration you're for me i always want to make something that i want to design something that i think is like has a real use case that is really improving uh, someone's life life um yeah i think probably, I, don't, I don't want to speak for you guys but i think that most most of the students who went to qut probably have the same mind frame mm. Penny? yeah what so 100 percent, and like I don't, I don't think anyone in industrial design is going to say no to that question it's been drilled into well, us yeah it, it, like <laughs> besides being drilled into us it's like number one where the world is going mm. towards number two like half of our degree like Every single design that we looked at, there was basically sustainability. I think sometimes there was sustainability considerations in the CRA. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah especially in, in industrial design, we're in quite a tight spot because industrial design was known for injection molding, for like mass production and things going in the landfill. Everything in the landfill was was designed by industrial designers, essentially. Right. So I think uh, like a lot of like 3D printing is one part of it. And then another part of it is maybe like, oh, people trying to um, design things in a different way to avoid them from being from going to the landfill. But then, you know, sometimes your job kind of forces you to do otherwise, which is what Liam was like mentioning. Um, yeah, for like for me personally, I would be really interested in like a lot of my unit projects. I, I feel like most of them, I designed something that was modular. Yeah, so what? I was gonna yeah. say that too because I, I, I was, <laughs> I was as you were talking about that, and you know, I didn't mention this for the sustainability, but like, yeah, you do a good job because um, first of all, great products, but with with their products, like, so they have this, it's all it's all modular, so all their systems are like pretty much all they're all the same threading and everything, the same size, but if you the threading on say this becomes you know worn down, which it does in time. You can just buy these into you can these individual components instead mm-hmm. of having to buy a whole new thing. Yeah. Um, and that's definitely a lot more sustainable. Yeah. That's the thing with sustainability, I think, is like when it's too drilled into us, like, oh, make your things recyclable, make this, make that. But like unfortunately, you can't make everything recyclable. Like there's some things that are already made the way they are, and it's gonna be very hard to change, you know, every component of it to make it recyclable. So like I think like that's what you're talking about. Like there's we need to move into other stages like modularity or even like reusability, um, remanufacturing, things like that, where we can still use the components, not necessarily recycle them, but use them in other ways. Yeah. I reckon it really depends on where you work as well. So as an individual, you can only do so much to make everything that you do sustainable. But in the end, say you're designing for a company and you design the uh, product in such a way that it uses the uh, least amount of material, you get an engineer to find out the best material that you can use that's sustainable, ecological, and all of that. But in the end, it depends on how the company is going to actually push forward and manufacture it or make it or do whatever it is. Um, another thing is, for example, there was a phone Google was going to release. It was a modular phone. Mm-hmm. And the idea being, oh, you drop your screen, just buy another screen, pop it on. It sticks on really easily. You don't have to like mess with it, learn how to like, go on YouTube and learn how to like open it up or anything like that. Say, Two years later, your camera gets outdated. You buy a new camera system, you just pop it on. That was a really cool idea. When, when I was a kid, mm. when I saw that, I was like, that's sick. But the reason they you cut that off is because it makes every other manu- or every other competitor obsolete. And that wouldn't just that that would really disrupt the entire ecology of the, the phone market there. 
That's why they cut that off. Yeah, but that's that why this option's good. Is that, that why it was cancelled? I didn't why? know. I just thought. I'm it, pretty sure that's why it was cancelled. Yeah. <laughs> and also, was... there was a oh, well. That's one of the reasons. Another reason was it, it didn't work that well because back thought, then, yeah. I guess, didn't have the technology. It was quite a long time ago. Would waterproofing be a massive like waterproofing and drop like you know? Yeah, like... that's that's. I think that's what they were really. The but back then, no. Good. Back then, nobody cared yeah. about waterproofing. Like phones didn't yeah. like it wasn't at a time where people cared about whether the phones were waterproof. But it was well, a premium feature though. So wasn't yeah, Motorola premium... the first one who did this? Uh I'm not I too sure. They had that like Motorola modular phone. Yeah. Uh, it had like little yeah, squares think... on the back, and you can just plug it in. Is that what you're talking about? No, it's it's a Google one. Let me just look. Oh, okay, back. maybe just Google. I I watched a video about um like why because, but uh. Phone batteries used to be like replaced, like you just pick it out and you put a new battery in. And like half of it, half of why we don't have that anymore is number one, waterproofing. Number two, like mm. trying to make phones as thin as possible. Like yeah. having a thinner battery needs it to not have like the outer shell and everything. But but the, the bigger half is just like once your phone battery starts degrading, you, you're just forced to buy another phone. Right. And that's exactly, better for yeah. the company. So, I reckon that's the real reason. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, in the end, one. we, we still the money. It's always from, it always comes we still, down. To it. We can't get away from like profiting and the big factory. Yeah, but I think like there's a lot of companies trying to combat this. I know uh what's that laptop? What's that computer company that uh they're starting uh, to do like modular modular yeah, parts? I know, so you can... I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, it's I like saw a very basic LTT. laptop, but yeah, yeah. Laptops <laughs> yeah. are just that's a whole nother board game, a whole nother board game. Because like I've always had desktops and like trying to find a laptop where you can even upgrade like RAM is just yeah. crazy. Yeah. Even yeah. with desktops, even with uh out of the shelf pre-built computers, you can't they design in such a way that you can't upgrade it and yeah. you're forced to go buy and the new RAM's laptop. like soldered to the motherboard yeah. like that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well. I, think, I, think, I think we're having um i was just thinking as we were talking about this like the last 15 minutes or so that um we have all these ideas you know that we're gonna well think it's modular we're talking about sustainability and stuff but when it comes down to it i think what we're going to find when we go into industry is that um it's going to be up to the client and it's going to not be in our control and a lot of the design yeah. itself, a lot of the time unless they get to the point where they they have the power to do that mm. uh, you know like some yeah. clients are like, I want this, I want it to be this cheap, you know, and it's like, okay, well, that's going to be just some fucking, uh, I don't know, PPE, whatever. Like, it's like, it'll just, yeah, I think uh, a lot of the time it's up to the client and it's a lot to your, um, yeah. super, like your, your, your bosses, essentially. Um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I think that's well, the yeah. one thing they kind of like, you know, convince you of in uni. Like, they teach you all these design thinking, design sustainability, like, you know, all these different elements. But, realistically unless you're like the senior designer at your firm or you own your own firm or you're designing your own product you don't actually have that much power and like you basically just do what other people say Definitely. so i think that is one thing that it's a bit of a um uh, expectation when you go into your industry that you still that you're going to be having all this creative mindset and you're going to be doing, doing all these different things but unfortunately i don't think in a lot of cases that's actually the case and you don't have time like when it comes mm -hmm. to like a if you're working for a consultancy they're paying you per hour a lot of the time, right? So it's like you you got an X amount of time to do this. You don't have weeks to fucking explore different, different yeah, you know, concepts. Um, yeah. yeah one, I, I, one way that I got a friend who he's not working as an industrial designer. He did design a QT, um, but he said you know like in, when it comes to the real real world um, application in design for a lot of especially in his industry is. It's like placing bets. You know, you have you don't have time. You don't have the luxury of time to do that. So you need to make a an educated decision and, and place a bet and see how it goes. And um, that's a lot more what it's like than you know having weeks to or two months to do a project uni. Um, in some cases, it can be more as well. Like for example, I I interned at Wow Me with Anton. You know, Anton. Mm. Yeah, for for a couple of months. Um, and he his whole process is very much long term. Like he doesn't really create a product that doesn't that is released for less than I mean it depends he he has obviously different time frames but generally he he likes to go through the design process slower and like you know go back and forward with the client and make sure the product gets to a very refined place mm -hmm. and I mean that's kind of quite similar to what we learn at uni really like his his design process so I suppose it depends on the consultancy that you work for for sure yeah mm. but yeah um to close up uh thank you guys for coming today it's been great to get your insights uh do you see increasing regulations 
around sustainability affecting design the design industry of the future i feel like um We're industrial design industry yeah, let's say let's stick with yeah. that yeah. <laughs> i feel like definitely to an extent but I also feel like we're all prepared for it. I mm. feel like everyone, like people who are studying existing industrial designers and firms are prepared for any, like there are, are already like regulations that are in place where, you know, like things have to be like this many percent, like, or, or packaging has like, like even cables, right? Like it, regulations telling iPhones to, you know, switch to USB-C just so there's less, cable waste so everyone's mm -hmm. like universal so that that's making a big change yeah. but yeah. of course like now everyone's aware of it it's been a thing for like a long time and yeah that's just where we're going and we all know it what about yeah, you I don't know much about the changing regulations to be honest with you mm. no. you reckon it's going to stick the same sorry you reckon it's going to stay the same oh no, no I think it'll be no it'll keep changing I mean it's always I guess it's history, right? But mm. um, I personally don't know what regulations are changing. But I mean, like, what we, we, with every, I mean, we've adapted before in industrial design. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I just don't know the specific regulation changes you're talking about. Okay. Augustine? Um, yeah, so I think it would change over the course of the years, but it'll be a very slow process in changing. And I'd say one of the main factors that drive the change to become more sustainable would be the lack of resources that we will probably um, encounter in the next few hundred years or so. So um, that would probably be one of like the main factors that would drive the world to start becoming more sustainable, use less materials, use a different type of material and implement more regulations and laws into the design of process and products and everything like that. Yeah. I think there's going to have to be some regulatory change around batteries, um, yeah. like lithium -ion, ion batteries and, you know, just, we have a little bit about cobalt and it comes from some pretty dodgy places mm. and pretty, uh, dodgy situations. Um, so I think that's going to have to change because I mean, it, like what do you, when you have your phone, this, I mean, your phone, it, it goes, um, you know, it breaks or whatever. What do you, what do you do with it? Really? You throw it in the bin essentially. That's what everyone does. Right? At, at some point, all these lithium ion batteries going to landfill. Um, so I, I don't know what's going to happen there, but I think there needs to be some kind of change because we have a limited supply of cobalt and lithium. I think lithium is fine, but um, cobalt is like a main component of lithium ion batteries, right? I, think uh, I have no silicon, idea. <laughs> silicon as well. I'm yeah, wrong with that. Um, but anyway, I'm yeah. wrong with that. Um, but yeah, I think that's a massive problem. And I think there's going to be like regulatory change around that. Um, and in design, you know, I I'm not sure how it's going to work at the moment, but. Yeah, I think mm. it was going that way. Yeah, one thing I was thinking is like with shortage of resources, like the chip shortage at the moment, obviously that's having such an impact on you know, electric car. Like they're like, oh, we want everyone to have electric cars, but there's not enough chips to even produce that. I mean, yet alone the other resources. But one thing I thought was interesting is like the, the prospect of moving back to mechanical concepts instead of chips. So like traditionally, when you think of like cameras, record players, uh, all these other all these things, it was all mechanical. There wasn't really it wasn't as digitalized as it is now and i mean if we if we keep a limitation of chips maybe there'll be more products moving towards you know not not adding a chip in just because you know just because they can you know maybe maybe relying on more mechanical sources to you know like they used to do in the past could be interesting because yeah, i mean absolutely. we have like mechanical cameras that have lasted like 50 years and they still work great i mean you couldn't say that about a, a you know a digital component even from these days you know so. Yeah, that's a really that's a really cool way of like, uh, yeah. I mean, that's probably a really smart way of implementing sustainable design into future products as well. Like, uh, I don't know if if you don't really need an electrical component for something of a specific product, you just go with the mechanical roots. Saves you, I guess, the hassle the hassle of, I don't know, designing a new concept or something like that. But also, um, it increases the life of the product because mechanical is a bit more, I guess, reliable than. Um, the electronic side of things hmm. i do feel like we've lost lost the craftsmanship of design as well in some ways like these days you want something to look nice just bang some digital componentry inside it make it look nice on the outside and it looks nice but then if you look at like a watch even from even even like a mechanical watch the amount of you know expert design and precision that went into creating a watch yeah. that just runs itself without batteries is just amazing 
Yeah, it is amazing. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Hmm. Yeah. Just to finish up, if you can give one thing to yourself in first year of uni that you some, some advice you'd like to give yourself first year that you think would really have benefited yourself where you are now, if you had known this advice, what would it be? Oh, that's a difficult one. One. We got one? Just one? No, one yeah. thing. One thing each. I got two. I got a lot. <laughs> yeah, I got a lot. Um, But I think that the one piece of advice, if I had to choose one, would be, uh, so I tell myself, Liam, uni is not what is going to drive your education. You have to drive your education. Hmm. Uh, and that you can't you, you can't go into it expecting that they're going to teach you everything that they're going to teach you CAD and they're going to teach you drawing like there, there's a limited amount of time there and they're not going to do all that and you have to be the one that's going to that to learn to educate yourself or you advice. yeah i'm uh go next and let augustine finish up <laughs> it's too hard this okay question. okay i i got i got a really small one Okay, number one is just buy a 3D printer. Mm. Number two, which is like the main one, learn Blender, please. Yeah. Because <laughs> like the, like from, okay, you have first year where you're learning sketches and some CAD. You have second year where you're CAD and you have third year where, where the first semester is still CAD. And then suddenly in the last semester, they they hit you with the, so we want some like animations, yeah. we want the CAD renders, we want this and that. And then, you know, I kind of, okay, it wasn't a requirement, but like for the highest level, like you want an animated CAD model, right? Like the people who bought Keyshot because it wasn't provided to us. I, I kind of talked to talk to Levi, our, one of our head lecturers that they're starting to get Keyshot licenses now. Oh, yeah. Because, yeah, well, that, should, that should be a because because I was like because I I told I I asked him I was like because Blender is the only free software we where we yeah. can have actually rendered animations no nothing else like in our in hey, our you could degree. use the SolidWorks Visualize yeah but, <laughs> <laughs> that's if you use SolidWorks which uh we had one unit that used SolidWorks that gave us a license yeah that's true so. Basically, what Uni provides us, none of that is. And Blender is actually pretty industry, like HBI, where mm. me and um, Augustine went to. They actually use Blender for their product mm. designs. Yeah, their product design. yeah. yeah, so... And yeah, it just man. does so much. It does so much. And I would have used it so much more if I like actually was recommended it. And I realized that in my internship at the academy. Mm. So, yeah, that, that's just the biggest thing. Just learn Blender, man. Like, Whoever's watching, just like limp, limp. Yeah, just, when you just, see Epi, like I don't want to like shout Epi's name, but holy, <laughs> wow, that's just yeah. that's like next level stuff he's doing with Blender. That's, that's awesome. something I want to start doing. That's Blender. That's Blender. Oh my yeah. god, like, it's Blender! Bad, I have no idea. I see some of the stuff he's doing. I'm like, wow, that lo looks like something out of a movie. It's wow. just insane. Yeah, I had no idea Blender could do that. Yeah, I really want to learn Blender. And even with like, you can you can set Blender up now because it's just it's just the biggest program. Like you can do anything with it. You can set it up to like create like geometry for you. You could be like, I want a million chairs and like put in all the parameters of a chair and it will just like pump out endless styles of chairs. Like you can legit do anything with Blender. It's crazy. Yeah. It, it, it's really intimidating in the beginning because, yeah. because you can do so much, right? You can do animations. Yeah. You can do like sculpting. You can coding. do modeling. You can do coding. Yeah. And there's yeah. like all these... All these things you can do but like if you want to do one thing specifically there are people mm. who get blended just do one thing and they do it very well yeah so yeah it's it's just the fact that like it wasn't even because in uni right they're like oh yeah you can use either fusion or solidworks and there's also there's also um like sketchbook that you can use but they nobody ever mentioned blender <laughs> right <laughs> nobody until until epi was like yo <laughs> right so how did epi get into it do you know Epi he actually it. started using it right from the beginning. Like I don't, I don't know. Like industrial design back then was pretty different. Like he said, he never even touched Fusion really. Really? I, they use some SolidWorks, I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. I, I feel like they should have. They should, probably from the get go, they should have just told us to work on SolidWorks. Like that's mm. really interesting. Yeah. I, I don't, like I still use Fusion and both, but like they probably should have said. Like, yeah. Personally, I like Fusion. Fusion SolidWorks. I did well, Blender initially, and yeah. then. Uh, I started using it and I was like, what is going on with this? So yeah, started, it's yeah. it's impossible to learn Blender without a tutorial. Mm. Yeah. 
You can't just mess around in it. Yeah, there's no way. It. There's no way. No, it's way too hard to do that. It's... Augustine? But once you get the hang of it, yeah. Augustine. Oh, so my advice for myself would be, I guess, everything that you guys said, <laughs> as well as, um, uh, what would I add? Yeah, uh, I guess lean into the hobbies, into your hobbies that are related to industrial design, because that'll really help you, I guess, formulate ideas and concepts and like ways, different ways of thinking for all your projects. Mm-hmm. So say you're into photography, which I am, like I go into photography, learn how to use light and things for your renderings and things like that, composition, whatnot. Uh, if you like, I don't know, building computers, go and do that and you can see how different manufacturers design certain things and how things are put together and things like that. So it'd, it'd be really useful to like really lean into your hobbies that are very close to industrial design. That's great yeah. advice, honestly. That's similar to what I was going to say. I was just saying that, like, basically live, breathe design. I, I think that they, they kind of say, like, when you walk oh, around, look at things and be like, how is this design kind of thing? Yeah. But I think you can even, going from the hobby thing, like, you want you want a new hobby and you feel like you're getting, getting bored of your hobbies, like, find a design-related hobby, like 3D printing or something like that. And then, like, all these different things you're doing in your life, they're all contributing to your career. Like, I feel like there's not many jobs where you can, like, for example, if you do like marketing, there's not really many hobbies you can have that are going to help you towards that. You know what yeah. I mean? Whereas with industrial design, there's so many like really fun hobbies, like sketching, drawing, 3D printing, yeah. like even like animating, like all these different things. They're all going to help you towards getting that career, getting that experience. And it's like, you can have so much fun just learning random new skills. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, and it'll, also, it'll also definitely help you with your final unit because in the final unit, you have to choose what you want to do. Yeah. So it's always nice to like have a, a handful of things that you're interested in yeah. instead of being like, oh, what do I do? Can you give me like options or something like that? There are, but like, it's better to do something that you are interested in doing. 100%. If, if it gets to you, you get into like a capstone, your thesis, uh, definitely try to, I mean, there's always exceptions, but initially when I was doing my, my capstone, I almost went down the path of uh, looking at uh, the voting system in Australia and that would have been now that I look back the most boring project, and I would have I would have pulled my eyes out of my head. Uh, and eventually, I went into something that I thought was more like uh, something that I'm like passionate about. Um, and if you get into the point where you're doing a capstone or your thesis, I definitely recommend doing something that you already have knowledge of, you're already kind of a domain expert in, um, and it'll make the process a lot easier, and you'll enjoy it a lot more. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Cool. Well, thanks, guys. Thanks for being a part of the first podcast. And yeah, I'm, I hope to get have you back in in the future when you're at your next stage. Yeah. Yeah. Congratulations. Thanks guys. Have a good podcast. See you again. See ya.